and then capitalism is over. But the problem is we have nothing to replace it with. And here's when we need our artists and others to tell us what kind of vision they have for a future that is different than that. Well, a future of play and work, meaningful work, would be one future that I think is not just utopic, but very possible. So there's a possible future moving forward that could be much better than it is right now, but we're not going to get there without the democracy of suffering as we're experiencing it now and will at least over the next 20, 30, 40 years until we figure this out. But we need to figure it out quickly. So welcome, Todd Dufresne, to the Conscient Podcast. This is actually the first remote uh, uh, recording I'm doing, so I, I hope it'll work well. I think you're in Thunder Bay, right? I am. Well, thank you for, for joining me today. Um, so I think you, you've, you've listened to the episode called 19 Reality, um, and we'll talk about that and other things, but maybe you could just start by giving us a, a quick introduction of who you are and what you do. Well, thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, my background is unusual for somebody in doing work in climate studies, I suppose, but this is more, I think, what's what it's going to look like in the future, um, in recruiting all different kinds of people to, to think and ponder these issues. My background is philosophy, specifically continental philosophy. Uh, even more specifically, I became almost by accident a specialist in Freud and psychoanalysis. And um, a few years back, I realized that in order to really reach and teach my students in a way that was responsible, I needed to um, delve more into the everyday. In fact, it was always a part of my practice as a teacher of intro students. So I always end with a discussion of advertising culture or, or capitalism. And it just so happened that I realized a number of years ago that, of course, the biggest issue around capitalism or advertising or consumer culture was climate change. So um, in a way, I came to climate change through my teaching and my responsibility to my students who were facing these issues straight on, and the conviction that some of the, some of the stuff that we're doing in philosophy um, needs to more uh, explicitly connect up with these issues that the students are dealing with. And there's nothing more important than this issue of climate change. So, so here I am. Philosophy professor Todd Dufresne. We're all being radicalized by reality. It's just that for some people, it takes a personal experience of fire, landslide, or hurricane to get their attention. I'm afraid it takes mass death and extinction. Whoever survives these experiences will have a renewed appreciation for nature, for the external world, and for the necessity of collectivism in the face of mass extinction. There's hope in this, although I admit it's wrapped in ugliness. Well, we'll get to your book in a second, but um, I, I've asked all my, I'm asking all my guests in this season to respond in which order they, w way they, they want to, um, to the, the premise of the, of the season, which is around the notion of accepting reality and uh, working through ecological grief, which is something that I've done, tried to do personally, and your book actually helped me with it. But uh, how do you respond to that notion of accepting reality and, and working through ecological grief? I think it's a necessary kind of uh, position to take, um, and it's not one that comes to me immediately and naturally. In some ways, intellectually, I'm probably aligned with post-structuralism and uh, the ideas of nominalism, which is to say that we create our reality through our language about it, for example. Um, but it became more and more clear to me that in the face of basically climate denial and a culture full of... Um, alt-truth and uh, fake news and conspiracy theories that um, we needed to address that in a kind of um, blunt way. And uh, a, a passage that you cite in your podcast and that I mentioned in, in my book is that in some ways I feel like I've been radicalized by reality. And when I say, re when I say that, I say that on purpose because what I'm trying to say is that climate change is reality and the climate deniers are obviously wrong about even undermining that notion. And so I, I agree with you in a certain way. I'm beginning from the perspective of the reality of climate change, 
which I go on to, uh, to discuss in the book and frame it in a way that was just as useful for me as it was for hopefully my students. Uh, in other words, I'm trying to understand how somebody like me, anomalous, somebody interested in post-structuralism, somebody with a background in Freud would come to uh, approach really the epistemological questions associated with climate change. And so you're starting with reality. I come from it from a kind of an opposite sort of pull, but we come to the same place in a certain way. Uh, so uh, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Journalist Jack Miles. Reality, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary, is the state of things as they actually exist as opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. Instead of being the method through which we observe a thing, reality is the nature or truth of this thing. Well, I, I wish I was wrong about the reality of climate change, but uh, it's so obvious that so many things are baked in, and, and your book uh, deals with civilization collapse. So maybe I'll just tell the listeners that I, I first heard you on CBC Radio, and I encourage anyone to go to Ideas and listen to the, the episode uh, where you talk about your book uh, more so than we will today. But I, I read it, and then it really resonated with me that that you've, you've able, you're able to uh, look at the philosophical side of things and to bring in history and sociology and all these different interconnecting points. So maybe you could just tell us a bit about the origins of the book and, and what are some of the key messages, um, the uh, democracy of suffering, not the suffering of democracy, though I guess one could play with the words because it's, it's, an, it's a provocative title as well. Uh, you know, in some ways, the book began very organically. I started it many years ago. In some ways, maybe you know the book better now than I do because I'm, I'm, I'm distant from it because I started it maybe 12 years ago and uh, I finished it maybe nine years ago. You know, you have to find a publisher. It takes time to push these things through the pipeline. Um, you know, what I did is I wanted to really explain how it is that uh, the philosophy of the subject, the philosophy that begins with enlightenment, that is tied to things like the industrial revolution, made possible a certain kind of person in the world. We call that in philosophy a certain kind of subject. And how in an era most recently of postmodernism, which is a kind of uh, reaction against uh, enlightenment thought and enlightenment subjectivity, enlightenment being in the world, we have uh, a long 40, 50 years of criticizing this notion of the subject, this rational subject, this enlightenment subject. But what we don't have is kind of an understanding of what's going to happen next, assuming that, in fact, we're approaching something like an exit from not just the enlightenment or from the postmodern era, but we're entering to something that is sometimes called the Anthropocene, which is an exit from the Holocene. So here we are talking about the history of ideas of what enlightenment, say, counter-enlightenment, or late romanticism, postmodernism, and we're not talking about the very biggest kind of shifts that are happening, which is not between these things at all, but towards an entirely new, uh, in, in your terms, reality, and the reality is the reality of the Anthropocene. If it's true that we're exiting the Holocene, wherein all these ideas about, let's say, the Enlightenment, industrialization seem to make sense, increasingly they just don't make so much sense anymore if we're exiting that comfortable world in which we evolved culturally and biologically. Historian Paul Krauss. For Francis Bacon, man is superior to nature, but man is also alienated from nature. Nature is harsh and unforgiving and something that needs to be conquered. Rather than seeing man as part of the web of nature, Bacon sees man as existing in a natural empire. Um, so the shift we're talking about is so grand that the only thing we can do as 
finite human beings is think about how other shifts have happened, for example, from enlightenment to a postmodern world, and then think about how much greater this shift is that we're going to approach as we as we head into the deeper part of the 21st century. So that's how I, I came to it. I came out of a philosophical interest in the history of subjectivity, the history of reason, of counter reason, and how we've responded as postmodernists or post-structuralists to this, these notions. In other words, uh, a, a long 20th you know, century discussion about uh, what the value of reason is overlaid with the post-World War II era of neoliberalism and the rise of a certain kind of capitalism, which is also responsible for creating a certain kind of person or a certain kind of subject in the world. And the question is, if we agree that subjects or individuals are created by these ideas and by these economic structures, what could we possibly imagine will happen to a subject, to you and I, when we enter into something called the Anthropocene? So the kind of biggest question I ask in the book is, you know, an answer to the question, what is the Anthropocene? And this is my clever way of reframing uh, Consult's question, which was, what is enlightenment? They're living through something at the moment. They ask a question, what does it mean that we're living through this moment? Which some philosophers think is a very unusual sort of idea for people to have, that they realize they're living through epochal times. And they ask the question, what does this mean? And I'm simply resuscitating Kant's question and raising the stakes heavily. What does it mean for us to live through, not the enlightenment, not just the effects of enlightenment, not postmodernism for sure, but something that's far greater than that, which is a move to the Anthropocene. These are the biggest possible questions we could ask, it seems to me, in the question of what the Anthropocene will look like and what it will do to human subjects and to other non-human subjects is the biggest and most important question to ask today, it seems to me. So it's a very much a raising of the stakes. The democracy of suffering is a raising of the stakes first raised by Kant, experienced by 200 years of Western thought and globalization, and the results are what we're living with now with climate change. Activist Naomi Klein What the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contraction in humanity's use of resources. And what our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed, and it's not the laws of nature. Well, the word suffering, yeah, it's very, it's, it's helpful and it's quite clear. Um, you, you imply that there's going, we have to go through a lot of suffering before wherever we get to, uh, whatever you know, we can imagine to be not necessarily a better world, but a survivable world. But I'm interested in that no notion of, of pain and suffering because it, it's, <laughs> I, I feel it too, that there, there's no way around um, the trap that we've set for ourselves and, and that unfortunately uh, that suffering will happen. And it's a question of lessening that suffering, reducing the, the pace of, of, uh, of the climate uh, emergency or climate crisis. But how do you, how do you do that? And so, uh, have you had feedback from the book, or have, you, have people sort of uh, responded with ideas? Because it's it's a provocative book, right? It's made to make you think about the issues, and in a way, shock you into um, an awakening. How, how has that gone with with the response you received? Uh, well, you know, there's a there's a, a one classic kind of response is that maybe the doom and gloom sort of approach to the catastrophe that is climate change in fact, just makes people more and more than ever entrenched in their own worlds. They say, for example, well, I can't do anything about it. So I guess I might as well not bother and just go about my, my business. Um, I think that's, that's, that's true uh, in a large way. That's really true. Um, sometimes people don't want to hear the message. And if they do hear the message, it gives them an excuse not to do a thing. But what I'm trying to say in the book is that clearly various catastrophes associated with climate change have not really caused us to make any serious changes. We're obviously not simply rational subjects that have seen what's happening and acted accordingly. So I see us as having only, as it's framed in your, in your, in your episode on reality, I mean, we really are up against this kind of uh, choice between uh, catastrophic change, which leads to mass extinction, which we're already experiencing, or you can try to find some sort of perverse silver lining, which is what I try to do and say, either we're all going down with the ship or 
suffering is so ubiquitous such that people will wake up. Public policy professor Eric Beinhocker. Humankind is in a race between two tipping points. The first is when the Earth's ecosystems and the life they contain tip into irreversible collapse due to climate change. The second is when the fight for climate action tips from being just one of many political concerns to becoming a mass social movement. The existential question is, which tipping point will we hit first? Uh, to be awakened to climate change, to me, it seems to me not to be awakened to reason, because obviously reason hasn't done it. We know what's going on. In fact, we know what we need to do even, but we refuse to do it. Well, I'm trying to say that nature will make us make that is, is making the choice for us now. We will be changing whether we like it or not. Naomi Klein is right when she says climate change changes everything. You know, her book is called This Changes Everything. She's right. And, and the question that you pose, the frame, the frame that you put it in is correct as well. We either have catastrophe leading to mass extinction, which we're having already, or we have catastrophe that leads to mass social change. My heart, of course, is with massive social movement, and there are signs of it growing. However, my rational mind, informed by science, sees irreversible collapse as the most likely outcome. And this collapse has already begun. And so we must make every effort for the benefit of future generations to s slow down the collapse while a mass social movement grows. So my, my, my feeling is that the silver lining or the only way forward is to understand that the suffering is going to be massive, unavoidable, in, the, in a sense that's ironic. It's going to be democratic. There's no escape from it, although there's places that are easier to live in, like Canada, probably, than places in Southeast Asia. So and I'm not saying that the impacts are going to be equal. I'm saying that once you have these impacts, it will change the economic and social fabric of our reality such that whether we like it or not, we're facing climate change. And if we face it, um, the hope is that maybe we can come up with some kind of partial solutions to save some parts, let some parts go, to pre preserve what it means to be civilized and to have a civilization, to transform our civilization into something different than what it is, obviously, because this one based almost entirely on industrialization and uh, lo the logic of financial capitalism uh, and perpetual growth. This is unsustainable, radically so, and it's all seems to me coming to an end. So, the, so I'd say that short the short takeaway is in the wake of the collapse of um, the project of enlightenment, reason, and industrialization as it's run through capitalism, we have something that I say in the book, which is the rise of the globalization of empathy. In other words, people become more empathic towards others and not just other human beings, but other non-human beings and to the plight that we're all sharing together. So we this either, either we have the democracy of suffering, either we have a collective raising of consciousness or a globalization of empathy, or we all die. The, when I say all we, that's, that's probably too ex exaggerated. There's going to be obviously pockets of people that survive here and there. But the question is, what kind of life do we want for our great grandchildren? That's right. You know, and where? And where are they going to be? They're obviously not going to be in desertified parts of North America or all around the world. They're going to have to be in certain places, places like probably Canada. What are we going to do when the people want to come here or go farther south to, to the southern parts that are maybe become more moderate, assuming that we can have enough food to feed people in these new areas anyway? I mean, the questions are so mind-bogglingly uh, 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 gigantic 
th- th- these questions are so big that we really have no choice but to face them. And so all I'm saying with the democracy of suffering is that this experience of our individuality and our subjectivity in the world is about to be radically changed. And the only thing that's going to, it's going to change to would be a sort of embrace of collectivism and empathy. So. Oh, I hear you. And, and you, you talked about what kind of future we will have. And of course there is science fiction writers and then now there's Cly, uh, Cy Cly writers who are anticipating some of that, uh, you know, some of them having a positive vision and some of them just uh, being catastrophic the way it likely to will, will be. But I'm interested in your thoughts around, because I, I, I used to work at the Canada Council and I've been involved in arts and environment and climate change and those kinds of things. Uh, what are your thoughts on the role of arts and culture in all this? Is, uh, obviously, they, everyone has a role to play, but do, do you see a specific uh, uh, type of impact or uh, role that that, um, that sector can play? Sure, I do. Um, I mean, for me, and speaking anecdotally, I mean, uh, the the way I got into this field in part was not just to read Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben, people like that, but it's, but I actually sat down and read the cli-fi literature, the 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 the, 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 the this the fiction around uh, uh, climate climate change, and um and 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 read what smart people thought looked like the near and far future of climate change. Uh, so I think it can this this kind of work is part for me of the project of being radicalized by. The vision of the future, not just by reality, but the vision of a future, which is a dystopic future, and r- railing against that dystopia with a more utopic vision. These days, I'm so much more impressed with the the project of thinking about uh, utopia and what can save us uh, as we move forward and what, what's worth saving. And I think that in some ways, artists have been on the cutting edge of thinking, not just because they use, use their imagination, but they, they use their imagination to rethink our present and rethink the future. Artist David Haley. We now need aesthetics to sensitize us to other ways of life. And we need artists to sensitize us to the shape of things to come. So not just intellectuals, you know, explaining how it is we got where we, how we got here from the past. In other words, doing some sort of critical analysis of philosophy and intellectual life and, but also having an option and the options of, for a different kind of way of thinking about the present and the future really come, it seems to me, from artists. Um, I must say, it's this is a tricky territory for me in a way because I think I say this at the, towards the end of the book. I mean, you have scientists doing almost all the work. Scientists doing the scientific work that lets us know that we're in trouble, and they've been doing it for a long time. And then they have to step up and do the advocacy work because not enough of my colleagues in humanities and social sciences, for example, are doing anything about it. But the one group that's really exceptional in that regard, in the humanities broadly conceived, are the artists. Um, and the novelists and the various kinds of visual artists and, and so on that have actually tackled this stuff. Um, so in a way, I think it's it's been, in some ways, the field's been left open, amazingly, to scientists and artists to help push us forward. Scientists are not built to do that kind of work. They're not built mm-hmm. to do advocacy work. They're not built necessarily to think about the future, and they certainly don't like getting mixed up in politics. Artists do that. Writer Charles Eisenstein. Expository prose generates resistance. But stories touch a deeper place in the soul. They flow like water around intellectual defenses and soften the soil so that dormant visions and ideals can take root. So behind what I'm saying is I have a pretty big complaint about my colleagues, not just in philosophy, but across social science and humanities, who are not somehow engaged with this work in a certain large percentage of all of their work with students and a certain amount of their own intellectual work. So I'm certainly not against working on 
Freud or Lacan or on Plato or Aristotle or Descartes. Of course, that's dumb. I'm not saying that, that, that we shouldn't be doing that. But I'm also saying, shouldn't we also be doing something else, which is relating these people to the plight we're in of our, of our, of our everyday, of our today, and of what's happening to the world as we move into the future tomorrow? So no, I hear you. Art, artists do this. So I, I, I'm deeply uh, respectful and uh, aware of what artists have done. And I think it's totally valid and useful because it makes um, accessible these ideas, these, these, these changes for, for the masses and also for other intellectuals. I mean, they'll drag everybody along. So I, I, I really appreciate what artists have done. Well, you know, today is April 1st of all days, you know, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, in future episodes, I'll, I've already interviewed a guy named David Maggs, who's written a paper for the Metcalf Foundation, which I encourage you to read because it's all about uh, sort of um, theoretical positions, aesthetical um, uh, thought on on the role of artists. And there's also Seth Klein here in Vancouver, who's uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called The Good War, A Good War. And he's also wants to activate different sectors, including the arts and cultural sector. So there's there's movement now in society, and there always has been, but I think it's growing now uh, exponentially in, in in the creative sector. So arts, culture, and the creatives uh, who who feel that they they not only have a voice but they have a role to play that is uh, going to be increasingly important. Especially as you say, we get into the increased suffering, uh, how will stories, how will uh, traditional knowledge, how will the things that, that humanity has developed that will be very, very useful uh, to not only survive, but, you know, I, I'm not an optimist, but I do think that we will survive. It's, it's just how will we survive and what mm -hmm. kind of world will we have? Uh, I agree with you on that. Um, and, you know, my, my daughter is t studying science at McGill, and, and I have a number of young people around me who are profoundly discouraged and also vital you know they're young people who want to live their lives you know and they want to to know how they what they can do and so as an older person i'm i'm listening to them their voices and i'm also trying to pull together knowledge that i think is going to be useful i do it through this podcast but you do it through writing and your teaching right because you have young people who are anxious in your class i'm sure there's a whole movement of um ecological anxiety and ecological grief that's really interesting and i'm going to be talking to some of those people as well But just to wrap up, Todd Dufresne, uh, Professor Todd Dufresne, <laughs> uh, is there anything you would like to add that we might have missed that you think is important for our listeners to know about either your book or, or your work as a philosopher interested in climate change? Uh, I think we've covered off the basics. Um, I, 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 I'd say I'm, there's, there's a couple things around capitalism that are very important. People often We'll talk about how it's a neo, it's the, part of the cause of the crisis that we're facing is the way we live our lives. And a major feature of the way we live our lives is, for example, consumer capitalism, or they'll call it neoliberalism. Or, you know, I think sometimes it's just important to call it what it is. It's, it's various forms of capitalism. And to get comfortable with the idea that maybe capitalism has caused this problem as it combines, I think, with the history of ideas, which also support the, 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 the role that capitalism plays. And to think that we need to find a way forward that isn't based on perpetual growth and the production, the endless production of stuff we don't need to maintain civilization. How do we maintain civilization moving forward without producing lots of uh, tchotchkes and crap? How do we live meaning? Well, you know, it's really easy. We don't need any of that stuff. Meaningful lives as we move forward have nothing to do with tchotchkes. But there's certain things we do need. We need food. We need water. We need certain things. And then we can lead, lead, you know, meaningful, creative, decent lives that are civilized still in a different way, but maybe even more civilized in a certain way. So, I, you know, the, the thing that I'm really interested in is uh, sometimes people aren't discussing how we're moving towards more and more AI and full automation. If you have full automation of the workforce, what are people going to do with their time? Well, I'll tell you one thing. They're, they're going to have to learn how to do with their time. They're going to have to be educated to become creatives in their own way, artists in their own way. Doesn't mean if you don't want to do that, do something else. But you're going to have to find something to do that doesn't involve toiling away for capitalism because capitalism has been killing us. So it's a really big, big thought. How do we get from where we are here to something in the future? I'm, I'm happy to take steps with uh, Bernie Sanders and democratic sort of um, socialism. 
but I think we need to defang the notion, the, the word socialism, so people aren't so scared of it. Not as big of a deal in Canada, but because of what's happening in the world, it's still kind of a boogeyman for everybody. We need to think about what communism means and what it has meant in the past and maybe come up with a new word. As I say to my students, let's not talk about communism. Let's talk about communalism. We know communism yeah. has been a failure. Can we talk about some other version that maybe if we all got behind it, that would work? Some sort of communalism? Forget forget all the things that have gone wrong with communism. We need to have something like it moving forward to save us. And this means we have to step away from capitalism, even as capitalism is is failing and dying, in my opinion, uh, right now, if it's not already a form of zombie capitalism, as I, as I argue that it is. I think capitalism mm-hmm. is over. But the problem is we have nothing to replace it with. And here is when we need our artists and others to tell us what kind of vision they have for a future that is different than that. Well, a future of play and work, meaningful work, would be one future that I think is not just utopic, but very possible. So there's a possible future moving forward that could be much better than it is right now, but we're not going to get there without the democracy of suffering as we're experiencing it now. And we'll at least over the next 20, 30, 40 years until we figure this out, but we need to figure it out quickly. Thank you again. Thanks, Claude.